My name is Scott Wilson. I'm service manager at called Oswatch, the uh, service for open source software, and that's based at IT Services in the University of Oxford. And we're an independent, non-advocacy organisation. We provide information about open source to organisations in education and the public sector. We don't tell people it's the best thing and you've got to do this. What we do is provide advice about how do you effectively use open source for your organisation? How do you make an intelligent choice not to engage with open source if that's what you want to do? The first thing is, do you know what free software and open source actually is? Now, Cable mentioned something about this in his talk. It was about a set of freedoms. So these are the original four freedoms of free software. So free means freedom in software in this sort of context rather than you know no money. So the first freedom, which we can see it's written by programmers, it starts at zero rather than one. <laughs> um, <laughs> the freedom to run the software for any purpose. So this means that when you sort of write software and release it as free software, that means they can't say you can use this software apart from if you're a terrorist. Or you can use this software as long as you don't do horrible things with it. So when I actually tried to write a software license, kind of taking the rise out of Google that said, this software shall not be used for evil, uh, so one of its clauses, and then that had to be struck out by the open source uh, initiatives, we actually, that's not actually free software because that violates freedom zero. Um, and so I think it was HP, I think, that had to kind of like get a lawyer to go, actually, we might have to use software for evil at some point. Um, so in that case, we can't really software, accept the terms of this license. There's the freedom to study and adapt. Yeah, adapting software for your needs. If you can't change the program, it's not free software. And the next two are really interesting ones. These are about community. So that you should be able to redistribute that software to help others. And you should have the freedom to improve it and release those improvements to get everyone to benefit. And these are kind of like the social aspects of free software. Now you also have the open source definition, which basically recasts many of those freedoms into kind of more kind of business friendly or legal friendly terms. But effectively it's the same kind of thing. No discrimination, discrimination against the endeavor, no discrimination against legal groups, distribution of licenses, license specific products, all kinds of things around protecting the integrity of software as something that can be shared, built upon, and reused and redistributed. But there's another aspect that people don't often get around open source, which is open development. Some software is released as open source, as in you can get the source code, you can redistribute it, you can modify it, but you can't necessarily contribute back to the original project and make an influence upon it because the project is managed by one company, one organisation. So for example, Android is open source, but it's developed by Google. You don't get to be a committer on Google's Android product, for example. Other products, projects in open source have an open development model, which means that there is a software community that makes decisions about that software that accepts contributions and sort of have meritocratic processes where people can become actively engaged in designing the software and changing the direction. So all the software, for example, are released by the Apache Software Foundation, which includes things like OpenOffice. Anyone can, if they have the skills, contribute to the project and eventually determine its future. It's a major secret in open development and closed development with open source software. Why is that relevant to education? There's two reasons, really, the common reasons for all public sector as well as education sector. One is sustained value, and there is meeting user needs. The sustained value is reducing costs, avoiding lock in, getting access to the best solutions for the purpose they intended. The other thing is amplifying investment made in software. So, in terms of reducing costs, we know we've got some research done on this. Open source solutions usually have a lower total cost of ownership. Not always, but usually, in most cases. And that's driven not by removing the cost of licensing software. Usually that's driven by increasing the choice of suppliers who can engage to deliver solutions. For example, if you're going out to get a uh, content management system and you opt something like Drupal, you probably have a choice of say half a dozen small companies within like 10 miles of where you are that can do the customization, hosting, all kinds of things like that. You can reduce the cost of services associated by it. So for example, in some recent 
uh, government procurement, central UK government procurement, the amount of cost savings is around 90%. So that's not savings of 10%, that's savings of 90%, as in, say, the, I think it's the Department of Pensions uh, intranet declined to like 150,000 a year to 11,000 a year, or something like that. So there are massive cost savings, they often come from how you unbundle the services from the software. Voiding lock in, anybody want to have a logo there, WebCT? <laughs> yeah. That was a bit of a wake up call, people got WebCT and were quite taken aback when suddenly it was acquired and got, we're going to cancel this product in a couple of years, good luck. And a lot of institutions had not thought about things like exit strategy or content migration or support standards or those other sorts of things. You're, you're stuck if that happens. Now, both closed source and open source software have the same potential issue, which is sustainability. You invest in a product to deliver a certain solution for your organisation. How do you know it's going to be there in two years' time? Still viable, still supported, still usable. With a lot of closed source, you just basically have to take it on trust. Well, that seems like a good company. Um, with open source, you cannot, in many cases, inspect the actual sustainability of the solution and the people involved in it. You can look, are they getting, you know, what's the, what will happen with contributions? Is it going down over time or going up? How many developers are actually involved in writing the product? You can actually go and look at the kind of stats. Oh, it's got 365 developers. Fantastic. Oh, it's got one developer. That doesn't sound good. So you can assess sustainability much more easily with open source. Two minutes, Scott. Right, okay. If you're not considering open source, you possibly lock yourselves out of the best solutions to the problem, straight out of the bat. So you may not actually be able to get access to the things that you really need for your organization. And the other thing is, if the sectors are involved in investing in software, open development in particular allows that investment to amplify because you can get contributions from lots of people around the world who may be share of the same problem and want to contribute. The problem is that where there have been investments in software development is projects in education. They've often been very close to a single consortium or single institution, not getting any buy-in from a wider community <coughs> and not being sustained. Now, the other aspect we're going to talk about is meeting user needs, which is just the inherent flexibility of open source. You can contribute, you can extend, and as with, so with OER, you can extend and contribute without having to ask permission to do it. You can change things because you have the right to change things. And a key requirement, key characteristic of the open development approach is that to then collaborate to share the costs of your niche requirements. I mean, there are other products out there for things like, you know, that compete with Neuro or ePrint. I want to mention a bit about cloud, because often we talk about open source, people say, yes, but can't we just put everything in the cloud? Well, actually the cloud is kind of orthogonal to open source. There are cloud services that are built out of open source software. So a lot of the services that you get from Google, Twitter, Facebook, GitHub, GovUK, Coursera even, are actually built from open source software. In other cases, you find a way to deploy your open source software solutions, whether it's Microsoft VM Depot or ULCC, for example, by things like Moodle Host. Or the actual service can itself be an open source product, so OpenStack, LX, Identica Data, right? You can actually get the code that runs the whole service and replicate the whole service. So it's an orthogonal concept. And I think I'm out of time. <laughs> so I'll rush through and just say I've got two recommendations. One is, it's important to level the playing field for open source and also for local, <coughs> small and medium-sized companies in the procurement of software and services, and that needs both a policy and a practice aspect. There have been policies put in place saying you will consider open source equitably with closed source solutions, but it doesn't really work if people on the ground doing procurement have no idea how to evaluate either. That's been a major problem, certainly with government. And also, where development new solutions and services are funded, use open development practices, no matter what the license is going to be. Because otherwise, you're not going to amplify the investment making in software, and chances are, it'll never go anywhere. So those are my two big recommendations. Thank, Thank you very much, much, Scott. Thank you. Uh, this is the, um, the, the aspect of, op of, uh, of open that, that has actually gotten quite a lot of uh, um, publicity recently anyway uh, with the uh, pu publication of the Shakespeare Review here uh, in the UK, but also the, uh, the declaration of um, the Obama administration uh, or of Obama himself to, uh, by in principle, open up uh, what data the federal government 
has uh, as, as open data. So why do that in th three um, bas basic kind of categories of, of reasons that I repurposed from the Open Knowledge Foundation? <laughs> um, so one reason you might, you, you might want to do that is uh, for transparency reasons. At the end of the day, it is a responsibility or a government um, governs in the name of, of its people, so the people have um, a, a right to see what, what is actually being done um, with, with that, or with the information that is gathered as part of, the, of that process. It, it's, it's a part of, the, of, of, uh, of your democratic rights. Um, there's also the, 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 uh, the, the aspect of releasing social and commercial value that is bound up in, in an awful lot of information that, is, that has to be gathered anyway for, uh, for a variety of reasons. And then finally, uh, the participation and engagement um, of citizens generally um, with uh, the workings of, of government uh, I think is, is, an, is an important aspect of what, as well. So what does that mean in concrete terms uh, or in concrete examples? So, for example, one of the things that, uh, that Westminster uh, has done uh, with the data.gov.uk site is uh, publishing the uh, COINS, the Combined Online Information uh, System. Uh, that's basically uh, all of the expenditure above, uh, if I remember correctly, £25,000. Um, and uh, they basically, that whole data set effectively sees wh where uh, these particular line items are being spent on. Now, like I said, the basic, in, the basic impetus for that is just to, to be able to show what, what happens with, uh, with um, our tax pounds. But there's, there's other reasons why, as a, as a data set owner, you might want to actually do that. Um, good old-fashioned old fashioned selfish ones, um, such as improving data quality, because at, at the end of the day, if, if you publish this data, you'll have more people with the motivation to have, um, to have a look at what's actually um, or what the data actually looks like, and spot errors in it, uh, if, uh, if there are any. Uh, motivates um, desirable behavior, arguably. That's one of the reasons, certainly, why the government is doing it. But that, I think, is a bit debatable, because it can, th that could be a double-edged sword. On the one hand, you want uh, people to do the right thing and, be sh and be, to be able to show that they are doing the right thing. On the other hand, of course, using open data as, as, a, as a kind of... A, almost like a disciplining uh, matter is dubious. I, I think we need to be careful. But it is an aspect and it needs debate. Um, and finally, it, uh, it can save money. That this is also um, what I know has, has been found by a number of, uh, of uh, local councils, is that often it can be cheaper to just um, take a lot of, um, uh, of data um, that is subject to uh, freedom of information requests and publish it in a structured way rather than try to, uh, to deal with every single individual uh, FOI request, uh, which can be quite expensive. Um, releasing social uh, and commercial uh, value. Uh, a, co a controversial but I think illustrative um, example of that is the ordnance survey data, particularly the postcode, of, uh, postcode list, uh, although that's not strictly speaking theirs. Um, so the, the, the impetus behind it is that, well, the Ordnance Survey government organization has all of this, uh, this fantastic geographical data. If we, if we open that up, uh, people can build apps on it, apps and new services on it, such as crime data, fix my pothole, all of those kinds of good things, which is true, uh, and that's, that's starting to happen now. But what, of, what is often, um, I think, skipped over is um, how it adds value to existing things that people are doing. So a very concrete example, um, I'm, I'm building an analytics platform. As part of that, I need to find out where people are from. Um, I've got postcodes, but that's as far as it goes. Now, building um, something that will uh, kind of let me group it or calculate distances, all of, those kinds, all of those kinds of things is not trivial. But if you actually look at the open data that the, uh, that the Ordnance Survey is now publishing, that's actually quite trivial. It's, it's um, a download and a few hours of work, and you're done. So basically, it, it is allowing me to do something that wouldn't otherwise be possible. And that, there's an awful lot of value of that sort of type in, in open data. Participation and engagement. Um, empowering individuals and organizations with, with information. Again, to, just to take an, uh, an, my own uh, personal experience, one of the things that I've done recently was uh, participate in the Scottish Government's Learner Journey Data Jam, um, which um, published an, a number of data sets, um, I, think, I think for the first time from uh, both the government as well as from the SQA. 
um, which allowed us to, uh, or everyone in, 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 that, uh, in that data jam, to basically come up with, um, with solutions that um, made it a lot easier uh, for learners to, uh, to figure out where they were in, the, in terms of their learning path and where they could go next. Choices, choices available to them, cor um, uh, courses that are offered uh, in uh, um, uh, nearby colleges, learning resources that, that, that are um, um, uh, apposite or appropriate for, 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 that particular for that particular course. In other words, it, ena it enabled them to take that government data uh, as raw data and um, and make it much more concrete and use it to structure their own, uh, their own lives. So that, that's just it for, for me, for now. Just as a, sta as a starting point, but there's much more in the, in the pack uh, to, to discuss. I a question <coughs> for Wilford. Uh, what do you recommend as far as the, the license on the data? Uh, putting it in the public domain, putting a license on it, keeping it all, all right preserved? Usually, what we what, what I think is increasingly the case is uh, uh, just quoting the name is easiest uh, um, because um, trying to disentangle uh, different restrictions in uh, when you start to mix data is very difficult, very difficult indeed. So usually it's easiest if you just do uh, if you just do both of the name. Um, yeah, I mean in, in the past um, there have been cases where um, quite liberal sounding creative create forms options like attribution um, have, uh, have been used for large data, data sets. But then once you start to mix it up and you, you present results that could, that could have three or four steps of, of different mixes, finding out who actually should be attributed and how it becomes a real, well, basically more trouble than it's worth. But of course, if, as long as you, as long as you uh, know in the source data where it came from and attributed it, so as long as you can find it back ultimately, uh, that, that works. I'm, I'm glad to hear you say that. That's the same recommendation that we make, that people use the CC0 protocol to just put it in the public domain. For data, that's, that's, that's the idea. Hi there. Uh, can everyone uh, hear me OK? I do apparently have quite a quiet voice, so I will try and talk loud so you can hear me better. Um, I'm here at Talk Bar, as you can see, the uh, uh, UK OER uh, program which was uh, led by uh, Driskin, the Higher Education Academy, on behalf of uh, uh, HEFKE. Now, we called it the UKOER program because we were kind of uh, hoping Wales and Scotland and Northern Ireland would like to join in, but they didn't. Uh, I, I don't actually know any of the politics behind that, but I'm uh, here to convince you that you might have made a mistake and you might actually want to rethink this kind of activity. Uh, now you've uh, uh, heard from Cable, you've uh, uh, heard from Scott, uh, you've heard from uh, Wilbert. If you're not convinced by the, uh, uh, the ethical or the uh, philosophical or the business case for mm, open education uh, and open education resources, you're probably never going to be. So I'm not going to try and say any further on that. What I am going to talk about is uh, what everybody in uh, higher education policy seems to be talking about at the moment. I should uh, confess I'm a secret policy wonk. Um, and uh, the big noise is the student experience, is the learner experience. And I would like to argue that uh, mm, investing in uh, UK OER style mm, open education is probably one of the best things you can do for the learner experience, for the student experience. I've uh, long argued that the student experience is linked completely and intrinsically to the uh, to the academic and support staff that they have uh, contact with and to the resources that they uh, have access to. The uh, resource argument for open education resources is actually very easy. Cables need it. Uh, that uh, uh, doesn't mean that he doesn't, uh, that he uh, didn't do it uh, really well uh, uh, just because it's easy but it actually is quite a sensible argument to make uh, uh, more access uh, uh, to resources. 
uh, students getting lots and lots of different uh, choices of uh, types of uh, uh, resources, uh, types of learning in process, uh, uh, types of learning process that uh, they can employ to meet their educational needs. That's pretty much uh, uh, nailed on. And uh, uh, UK OER and uh, related work has released thousands and thousands. I think we're on about 16, 17,000 uh, separate education resources released at the moment. But despite the fact we stopped actually funding all these projects, they love it so much, they just keep doing it anyway. We can't stop them. We can't stop them using the uh, 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 hashtag. We can't stop them talking about this stuff. Uh, I think we were kind of charged with uh, bringing about something of a cultural revolution. It's not, it actually wasn't just a matter of piling up lots and lots of resources. It was a, a, a changing hearts and minds, a changing culture. And to do that, we uh, worked directly uh, uh, with academic staff. I think that's actually uh, uh, unique in the world. Pretty much all the rest of the open education resources stuff I know about it's been uh, grant funds, uh, uh, large pots of money directly to institutions or uh, dedicated units uh, within institutions. Uh, we didn't do that. Uh, we worked uh, primarily with academic staff and support staff that are working with students uh, 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 day in and day out. They didn't uh, necessarily build new resources to release. Uh, they released the resources actually they were using with their students. Um, and we uh, did this, as you can see from the slide, in a variety of ways. There is uh, piles of links on this slide, by the way, to various outcomes and outputs that uh, you can read later. There's lots of stuff that came out of uh, this. A lot of stuff is worth reading. But we started off, and this was something else also, I think, uh, unique to this program. We started off actually looking directly at uh, 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 the academics. What kind of a benefit could they get from releasing open education resources? Actually, was it just going to be something else that they uh, had to do? And we said, okay, just actually go away and uh, try this stuff. Uh, try it in different uh, configurations, different approaches, and uh, tell us. There's a spectacular uh, wealth of experience in the evaluation and synthesis uh, uh, final report. We saw people realizing benefits that we wouldn't have uh, uh, dreamed of. And we got uh, kind of overwhelming feedback that this was a positive thing for academics to be involved in. It actually brought them into contact uh, with um, activity in their uh, subject area across the world. It brought them into contact often with other academics in the same institution that they'd not talked to. It uh, forged links and networks. It brought people together and made people more confident about their resources, the quality of their resources, and it actually gave them access to, uh, to, the, expertise of, uh, to the expertise of others uh, uh, to enhance the quality of their resources. It was an immensely transformative experience. At uh, phase two, we started looking at uh, 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 users. Uh, how can we um, encourage uh, discovery and use? We came across something quite interesting uh, 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 finding, I think, that Alison Littlejohn and uh, Lou McGill noted especially, that uh, communities of uh, uh, practice are, in some cases, an incredibly good way of sharing resources and building awareness around resources, but they can be off-putting to people that are actually out side of those uh, communities and uh, there is a chance that um, people might end up just talking to the same people all the time and not actually expanding the communities. So that was something we learned from that um, 
experience and we can uh, uh, talk now to people that are, are setting up these uh, communities in all parts about actually expanding the communities and uh, uh, bringing more people in. The third phase, this was 2010, 2011, so we're uh, uh, right in the middle of uh, uh, kind of austerity and uh, competition and all the uh, 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 new pressures that are being placed on institutions. We wanted to set out uh, how open education resources was not uh, uh, just a good idea in its health, but it uh, kind of very obviously is, I think. Um, it could also help institutions uh, build closer links with local in, uh, employers. It could uh, help institutions uh, do outreach work. It could uh, uh, help them uh, collaborate with each other. And uh, that part of the program, I think, actually uh, uh, was a massive success that we, we, we got all of this stuff uh, 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 happening. We started making an impact at institutional level and we started to see institutions like the University of Leeds, Leeds Met, uh, uh, UC Falmouth, et cetera, et cetera, actually uh, putting open education resource into their strategies, not uh, having a, um, a separate OER strategy per se, but actually linking this stuff into their core learning and teaching strategies. It becoming an expectation, if you're making learning materials, you would probably uh, uh, want to put an open license on, you probably want to use open materials uh, to make them, you probably want to release them online. And the, uh, the uh, community that we uh, 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 built up, even after the end of these uh, funded uh, 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 projects, it kept happening, it kept existing. They're actually running a, a conference. They uh, ran one this uh, uh, year. No uh, funding uh, whatsoever from the program. They're running one next year as well. And um, it has become this movement. It uh, uh, has become something that uh, kind of we as uh, funders, as policymakers, are no longer leading. Uh, actually, we're supporting it. We're saying, okay, this is something that is continuing to uh, happen. How can we support this? So, um, for a total of, I think, around 14 million uh, uh, pounds of investment over th three years, which is the equivalent of uh, 1.6 uh, centres for excellence in learning and teaching, or a small percentage of one uh, uh, Hewlett uh, Foundation uh, grant. Uh, we have achieved all this. If you want to uh, go away and read one uh, document about this, uh, kind of area of work, I'd recommend this one at the bottom there, currently called the uh, Hefke OER uh, uh, Review, which is a slightly misleading title because it uh, uh, covers all the work uh, uh, done in England about open education resources over the last three years. It was written by uh, Lou McGill, Alison Littlejohn, with support from um, a load of people all around the uh, program, many of whom are in this room. So that concludes what I wanted to say. So thank you very much for your attention. Yeah, MOOCs, I think I've put a question mark here about them being the elephant in the room. And I think in terms of open educational resources, as Cable alluded to in his presentation this morning, I think they are because I think they completely exemplify some of the issues around the interpretation of open and what that actually means in terms of open as in free and gratis. Um, so I'm just going to take you through a, a, a bit of things about MOOC. Now, I, I really like this image. Um, it was done by Julia Forsyth at a recent um, GISC webinar on um, MOOCs, and I think it really captures some of the issues and the confusion and the chaos around MOOCs. I think it summarizes it really well. Um, can I just do a quick survey? I'm taking it everyone in the room is familiar with, with the word, if it is a word, MOOCs, yeah? Have many of you have done a MOOC? Oh yeah, okay, we're in the converted, so I'm, you know, there's a lot of people do. Um, I'm not really gonna talk, 
Yeah, well, signed up, not completed a MOOC. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Um, so, you know, I'm not going to go through the history of MOOCs because there, there's a lot around uh, being done about that, but there is an ex a really good article by Audrey Waters at Hack Education um, talking about 2012, the year of the MOOC, and it really sums up the history of, of MOOCs. So if you are interested in finding out a bit more, I thoroughly recommend that. Um, this is just a timeline. Uh, you'll see on your... Um, Tables. There are some copies of a recent paper from our colleagues Lee Yan and Stephen Powell, a publication called MOOCs and Open Education and the Implications for Higher Education. And again, this kind of resonates with some of uh, what Cable was talking about in his presentation about disruptive um, education. They were looking at, at, at the uh, potential for MOOCs to be truly disruptive in higher education. But there's a really nice timeline um, in the in, the, in the, the paper, which just kind of shows the relationship between MOOCs and the whole uh, open education movement. So I think they did come, you know, I don't think we would have MOOCs, we certainly wouldn't have the name MOOC, I don't think, um, if it hadn't been for the whole open education and, and open movement I in general. So, you know, really from the turn of the century, we have seen um, this more, um, you know, interest and impact and people being involved in the open education community. Um, and of course then sort of 2011 and, and last year, I think there's been a bit of a skewering of, of what's been happening in terms of open and maybe what we um, consider in this room as open education. And when we've had some input from uh, commercial um, organisations as well with um, the, the ad advent of, of seed funding and com uh, venture capitalists. Now, there's a lot of myths around MOOCs, which I'm sure you're, you're aware of as well. I love this quote. This is about MOOCs. The single most important experiment in higher education. Yeah, maybe it is, maybe it isn't, but you know, who knows? Um, oh, oh, sorry. And uh, just because David's in the room, we can't do a presentation <laughs> without the MOOC poster. But I think this kind of 1950s B movie kind of like the evil venture capitalists are going to get us an education really kind of sums up some of the the tensions um, between open education in, in the freest and most open sense and you know what's actually happening with, with MOOCs. Um, and these are just some other quotes that I, I really like. These are from Sebastian Thrum in a, a, an interview he did with The Economist last December. Um, in 50 years' time, there'll only be 10 universities left in the world. Well, I don't think China agree with that or the, the rest of the BRICS. I think they're building universities at quite a high rate. I don't think they're going to get rid of them all yet. Um, they're opening new opportunities for the agile and threatening doom for the laggard and the mediocre. None of us want to be that. Um, but this one, the cost of courses can be spread over a huge number of students. Well, I'm not sure if that's a myth, but I think that's been a goal with all, we've all been aspiring to for a long, long time. And as, again, as Cable and the other speakers have said today, that, that's something that Open can actually maybe, and we've started getting some evidence that, that Open can actually start doing that for us. Um, There'll be wholesale brack bankruptcies over the next uh, decade among standard universities. Well, I think we could actually see quite a shift in the university landscape, e even here in the UK. I don't think it's going to be through MOOCs. I think there are other factors that might have more of an impact on that. And this is one of my, again, one of my favourites when I talk about MOOCs. We have to drop indifferent lecturing or teaching to concentrate on something else, such as brilliantly set and marked examinations. I don't know how you brilliantly mark an examination. I don't really know, but I think that's kind of a, a strange thing. Yeah, and obviously watching videos and doing multiple choice questions, uh, qu quizzes. Um, another thing, sort of coming onto this myth and this the myth and the, the doom and gloom, was that our, the the essay, the avalanche is coming, um, from some colleagues in in Pearson, which again. Uh, I'm going to just pick on David again, but David Kernan, if you haven't seen it, did a very good critique of this essay, which is worth um, having a look if, if you hadn't. But although we might be in education kind of thinking, oh, well, these MOOCs, um, I'm not really sure what they are going to do, and, you know, they're not really open or whatever, there still is a huge interest. And I think, you know, headlines like this, over 300,000 people signing up for six courses. I was one of them, and I'm sure that there are many in the room that signed up for the Edinburgh course as well. There's a huge interest. People want access to open education. As a student, as a learner, it was great. I've been a MOOCaholic this year. I'll you know, completely confess that. I'm signing up left, left right, and centre. It's great. I can sign up. No risk, no fee. Yeah, you know, there's no fee. It's, it's great. So how do we balance these kind of tensions? Um, I saw this tweet the other day from George Roberts, a colleague in Oxford Brookes um, University, and I think that actually sums up some of the tensions that we have. You know, open learning provision is good for, 
pro providers and participants, participants. But funding does remain a challenge, especially for small providers. But I think how we actually create content and how we share them, you know, it, it is very challenging. And I know Cable gave some really nice examples of foundation funding in, in the US. We don't have that here in the UK and, or in Europe to the same extent. So how can we build on work of work um, and funding from JISC and from, from the academy, et cetera? How can we actually utilize that? Um, and again, I think now um, in the last couple of weeks, we've seen some of the uh, some of the myths and maybe the hype around MOOCs seems to be dying down. There, are, you know, certainly surveys coming out not just from uh, Provost in in America, but also in the UK. The kind of the threat, if you like, of MOOCs seems to be uh, receding. Where um, I'm not going to say that we can all go back to being dull and laggard because we weren't that before. Um, but you know, the, the, we, I think people are realizing that MOOCs aren't going to take over universities as we know them. Um, and as Martin Weller at the Open University um, put very succinctly in his blog last, last week, um, we can all stop worrying about MOOCs now because I think quite what's actually happening is we're seeing that the MOOC providers, the big MOOC providers like Coursera, Udacity, they're actually what they're actually turning into are, are content and course providers. So they're not an alternative <coughs> to universities. They're going to have to work within our traditional systems as well. Um, but going back to the open ed educational uh, resources, I think there are some people in universities that are sitting back and going, yes, we knew that wouldn't happen because we don't do that. We simply don't make our resources openly available. We don't have to. Um, and if we think about things like FutureLearn, which again is quite interesting, it's sort of the UK MOOC platform, but it's not really talking about being a MOOC platform. And it's, when we look at its terms uh, of use, and again, uh, Lorna wrote a very good blog post a couple of weeks ago about that. I'm not going to read things out to you, can, you can look at that. And this was a reaction to a lot of um, conversation on Twitter about the terms <coughs> and conditions. It's really interesting that you have a number of UK universities a number of them who have really supported the open education movement, including the Open University, the University of Southampton, people who have had a lot of publicly funded resources um, and have released open educational content, they're signing up to these terms and conditions. So they are, in some ways, creating new content um, because we're getting back to this old argument that OERs aren't of a high enough quality to be used. Um, in everyday education, which I think most of you in, in the room would agree was an, another myth. Um, but you know, the, the ki although they are using Creative Commons license, they're not actually releasing really open educational um, o o OERs. And you know, why is that? Why are they doing that? You know, I think this, we need to ask some serious questions of our universities. And I just want to leave you with um, this thought, and uh, this has been tweeted actually today. You know, I think in Scotland, we can do that. It's a small enough country that we could actually do something really quite different. And we all can do things. We can do it. And again, people have stolen half my presentation just to kind of er earlier as well. There's obviously there's the European um, MOOC platform, um, the Open Up Ed. And for guidance, again, this is a link I got from Cable. There's, um, this open educational resources and collaborative content development, a really good guide that's been um, released primarily for K-12 schools uh, in, the, in the, uh, the US. But the, the principles are applicable anywhere. So I think you know, we have a really good opportunity to do things. Um, we should be out licensing things uh, openly. I fully support what uh, Cable was saying that you know, all publicly funded resources should be available openly. And I always used to say when we started the, the JISC and the, the, the Academy program, when I was talking about it to people, I think the attitude we want, it's a bit like having a puppy for Christmas. You know, an OER policy, it's not just for the length of a funded program, it should be for life. So let's try and do that here in Scotland today, and I hope today will be the start of us trying to do that. Thank you. Thank you, Sheila. Uh, any questions for Sheila or for David? Yes. Uh, it, it's half a question and, and half a comment. I'm Sue Rigby, I'm Vice Principal Learning Teacher at the University of Edinburgh. So uh, there are moves that you keep yeah. referring to. Um, I think what we see as an advantage to keeping some control over these statements <coughs> of knowledge is that we can avoid them degrading. I think the only thing we have to balance against the resource being entirely open 
is the risk of the degradation that you can see if you read any newspaper article and look at the comment thread that follows it. Um, and I think one of the challenges in Scotland is to keep not just information available across the board, but the highest quality of information available. So for example, looking at the impact of the move that we ran on philosophy to schools in the Highlands who had students taking that and learning from it, gives us a channel by which we could very quickly direct the highest quality of information and the interpretation of that information right through the Scottish educational system. We could take MOOCs or OOCs of any kind we wanted from any university that we chose to direct them through our systems into communities or into schools, but at the same time as retaining some certainty that we are not going to end up with creationism being added to a biology MOOC, with uh, anything that, that we might feel reprehensible in our open society being imposed on an educational resource. Mm -hmm. um, I think there is a difference between the resource and the course. If uh, somebody is running a the course, they curate the resources that are on those. The, the uh, courses may not go into uh, great if I put something on the internet on my blog or something. Uh, uh, no one's uh, 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 going to change what's on there. Uh, because I use an open license, people could uh, uh, take it elsewhere uh, and uh, uh, put it out of context, etc. And that's always hilarious. But it doesn't change the original resource. Uh, the original resource is still uh, there. Uh, so I think a carefully uh, curated collection of open education sources are not uh, going to degrade uh, by themselves. Uh, the only issue would come, I think, if you put uh, 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 something online, uh, let people make copies of it and change it, and then make new copies. But that is something that uh, kind of might also be a benefit. Uh, somebody might uh, take it, now they need to do that with it. Uh, animation and links have more content. Cable, do you want to respond? Please? Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> it, it's a real concern. And when we were, when I was at the community colleges in Washington, we had this very same discussion. Um, how we shouldn't, this is a big call from the faculty, we shouldn't open up our content because other people will modify and change it into things that we don't support and don't recommend and don't endorse, right? And we need to, there's a quality control issue there. We went through a bit of a cultural shift, and it took some time. <laughs> it took a lot of discussion. But the tagline that we ended up with after the year of discussion was, we need to move from not invented here to proudly borrowed from there. And the reason we came up with that was we said, there are, even though we don't like to admit it, there are more smart people outside of our institutions than there are inside of our institutions. We think we, we know we've got great faculty, and we know that we've got great quality control, but there are going to be bugs and errors in what we produce. And if we open it up, other people will be able to modify it. There's, there was still the concern of, what if somebody does something bad? What if they add creationism to my biology course? Uh, part of it is addressed by what David said, and that is that uh, the curated version of my course, I control. Right? If, if people know that they want cable grading's biology 101 course, they can come to Cable Green website and there it is, or the University of wherever I work, right? So part of it is that, is the brand. And they will come to you because you've got the brand. Uh, this, this is really, and I invite my open source colleague uh, to chime in on this. This is one of the difficult ideas about open to understand until you do it. So with uh, open source, for example, uh, what's the phrase, many, many eyes? Many eyes make better code. Yeah, many guys make better code. <laughs> and the same thing is true in education. It's, that's a difficult shift because I can tell you when I was trained as a, as a doctoral student, the advice that my committee gave me was uh, you know, don't share your content, don't share your research, never share your data because it's a career killer, but also because somebody might do something wrong with your materials. Um, that's embedded in us as faculty. And in an open world where you can share how people can make your work better, it's difficult to overcome that, but that's a shift, cultural shift that needs to be made. At the risk of being a complete license, yeah. um, 
you release something on in the open license, you uh, uh, surrender uh, 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 your uh, rights. But there is actually one group of rights in English and Scottish law that, that you cannot surrender, which is called your moral rights. And that's the, the uh, uh, law that says What's if somebody does something completely reprehensible to your content, then uh, uh, you have the right to talk to them and say, okay, no, I'm not going to do that. Uh, uh, you assert your moral uh, uh, rights. And even under the most uh, uh, liberal of the consciousnesses, you cannot uh, 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 waive your rights. That level of control. It's called the non-endorsement clause. So if someone took your course that had a CC license on it and they did something you just didn't approve of and you don't want your university's name associated with it, you can actually invoke this non-endorsement clause and say, yeah, do not give me attribution. Uh, you, you can still do whatever you want with the materials, but don't don't link back to me. Mm -hmm. And legally they have to comply with that. I mean, these are certainly some of the issues that hopefully we can discuss in more detail this afternoon about what the benefits and the threats and the drawbacks are um, regarding openness. So uh, hopefully we'll be able to have an opportunity to discuss those at, at some length this afternoon. Um, so our last two speakers are um, Turi Hul from the Nordic o Open Education Alliance and also chair of Sena IFSS uh, Workshop for Learning Technologies. Uh, so first of all, over to Turi. I have to admit that I have a MOOC slide in the presentation as well, so let's see if I come to that. That's hope. So this alliance is a, is a pretty new invention. I mean, we, we came uh, about it uh, this year, and we have uh, a kind of all the Nordic countries with us with a little bit of a question mark about uh, Iceland. We, we think we have them on board, but uh, they are not very clever to answer the mates. But there are some other uh, interesting uh, areas as well. You have uh, the Faroe Islands, for instance, they are there. And you have the Åland, which is uh, regions within the Nordic countries that, that are with us. And we have Scotland down there. And uh, you are welcome to participate in, in this because it's a very open, very loose alliance trying to do a number of things. Uh, well, we are focusing on the Nordic countries and, and, and there might be some, some, some exchange between the Nordic countries and, and Scotland. There has been in the history and, and why not now? Um, why do we focus on, uh, on the Nordic countries? Because it's, it's a perfect ground for openness, for, for uh, sharing. We have done that quite a lot. If you wa wonder if there is rain here, um, you can either go to the window or you can go to yr.no, which is the uh, weather service that's uh, very popular based on open data. That's a Norwegian service that's quite a few people use. So there is a tradition for being open. So we have open as in open data, we have open as in open access, but we haven't really come to open OER yet. So that's, that's something we have to address. So we have issued a position paper that was in, 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 in the information pack that, that came here. And what else? We use the Paris Declaration as a kind of starting point. And we are also very aware of the opening up education initiative of the uh, European Union. It's going to be launched in September and there are quite a few initiatives and even some money coming out of that. And that is, that is uh, clearly uh, forces outside of the Nordic region that, that, that work in the direction of OER, which we are not really taking up in, 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 in the Nordic countries and we want to do something about that. So we, what our primary goal is to, to, to develop education. Why is not open or we are uh, part of that discussion yet? Well, in, in most of the Nordic countries, or, or, or all of them, we have free education. So the kind of, the, the need to, to, to kind of innovate through use 
of uh, OER isn't that great. So we had to find other reasons why we should do that. Uh, we should say, okay, there are lots and lots of, to gain by, by collaborating more. I mean, it's, it's been uh, kind of said a number of times now. We also have the kind of global development aspect. I mean, it's, I mean, the Norwegian missionaries, they, they went to Africa and tried to, to, to sell whatever they wanted to sell. But, I mean, to be kind to people seemed to be something we, we are very fond of. So why don't we kind of engage in, in developing education on a global scale? And you can't do that via the, the, the traditional model. You have to, to use, uh, for instance, open education. Uh, so what we want to do is to, to, to guide governments, institutions and organizations, find a way to, 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 to target the, the, the message so, so it, it, it hits the right spot in, 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 uh, on the right level. So in doing that, we, we have to go through some, some analysis of, of the barriers and enablers. And, and if you look upon the position paper, there are some, some, some starting points there. Um, and at the end, we want to come up with, with good practices and, 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 and policy implementations that we could, uh, could uh, uh, provide to, for instance, rectors, uh, headmasters at all levels of the educational system so they can, could really have policies to, to implement. So it's easy to, to, to bring it uh, to the boards and, 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 and commit to, to open education. So there are some other things that's uh, special about the Nordic countries. We have very small languages. I mean, you have, it's very small up there, so it's kind of representative. We have Norsk, Svenska, Dansk. So then we have something Finnish, which is completely strange. And we have Pöryar, and, and even some other languages as well. And then, of course, we have English. So since we have to, to, to work with the, with the pins, we have to speak English, because that's our common language. So then we have you on board. You can be part of this uh, conversation. But nevertheless, we have to to really understand what, what, what language and culture means when, when we are talking about open education resources. Because there is talking, I mean, uh, there's been talking about uh, resources that travel well, which is, that is not that easy. It's not only about resources that travel well. It's resources that has to be kind of repurposed for the cultural and language kind of aspects that uh, you, you're dealing with. It's, it's, not, it's not just a matter of translation. It's, it's a matter of adaptation and, and repurposing. And that kind of discussion is, is important. And it's not that easy, actually, when, when, you, when you are just transforming, a, transforming a, or transferring, rather, a, 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 an English resource from one part of the UK to the other part. I mean, there are different cultures here, as I have learned, but, but you know, my point. <laughs> okay, so, no. Ah, I'm learning. There. This way or this way. So, what we want to do is to, to, to really go both ways, I guess. Uh, so, just two, uh, a couple of, 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 of uh, lessons. The National Digital Learning Arena, which is, is kind of the acronym NDLA in Norway, they have uh, released a lot of resources for almost all upper secondary schools. And they have done that uh, as, as a public enterprise. I mean, they are owned by the, uh, sit, the, um, uh, the, 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 the counties and they have met a lot of resistance by the publishers. They have even been brought to the, uh, the uh, Human Rights Court because it was a violation of human rights that the, 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 the public money is spent on, on this. So this is just an example of of, of, of a lesson or, or, or a case that could be studied, even if it is 
in, in, in school system, it's, it's a lot to learn here, also for higher education. So my point here is we should look beyond our own kind of sector in order to find good examples and, 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 and good cases for learning. So that's, that's one. Then the MOOC slide. Um, MOOC is, is, I mean, it, it, it's, it's an enabler for discussion. So the Norwegian uh, government just announced that they were going to, to, to make a, a government report on MOOCs coming up next spring uh, with the first report at the end of the year. And of course, this we should use in order to kind of put the OER agenda on, 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 the, on, on the national agenda, so to speak. And, and so we, we need to find the energy where it is and know it's MOOC. So, uh, you will find more information in, uh, on, on this URL, uh, the nordicoer.org. This is a project that's, that's got some pocket money from the uh, uh, Nordic Council of Ministries just to, to, to uh, organize some, some activities. Uh, the Nordic o Open Education Alliance is, is broader, it's a looser thing, but we have a project that, that, that could be the vehicle for, for, for building this, uh, this alliance. So this is a, a good URL to try to follow, at least from, 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 uh, from uh, this autumn when we are picking up some speed. So, talk. That's uh, Norwegian for talk. <laughs> and I guess you. So our, our last speaker is uh, Paul Richardson, who has come from the Just ILC in Wales. And he's going to tell us a little bit about some of the initiatives going on. So. Uh, thanks, Lorna. Uh, <coughs> Yeah, I'm Paul Richardson. I, I normally work for the GIST Regional Sports Centre uh, in Wales. I put half a hand up when Cable asked earlier if anybody was here uh, from the government because I'm currently um, on a contract with the Welsh government to advise them on uh, questions very much related to uh, what the other presenters have been talking about this morning. Um, so I, I'm here really to, and I'm really grateful uh, for the invitation, um, really to um, participate in a conversation about uh, what the implications are for government um, uh, of these new developments and for government in terms of a uh, small government, a government, a devolved government, a government which is also partly dominated by a, a larger government as, as the UK government is here and, and also maybe a participant in, in, in other more, more, more global kind of initiatives as well. Um, so we're kind of working our way um, towards uh, through some of these questions. And it, it, my work really emerged from this written statement uh, from a man called Leighton Andrews, who was at the time Minister for Education and Skills in Wales, um, uh, from dating back in February, when he set up um, a, a working group to investigate these issues of the kind of great and the good in Welsh uh, higher education and in associated services. Um, and, um, sorry, I hope you can read this from the back. Um, this, was, these, this was the kind of remit of the group. These were, these were its terms of reference. Um, and uh, they basically uh, relate to uh, threats and opportunities um, of changes in the, uh, the, the kind of online landscape, the, the landscape of online learning. Um, and somewhere hidden in, in behind those terms of references are really... Um, well, there's explicit references elsewhere in the document to OERs and MOOCs. Um, so this is the Welsh Government wondering uh, what it should do about um, these massive changes, if anything. <clears throat> um, and and just, so, uh, just so as you, you know who the, the people involved uh, are on the group, um, uh, they're named uh, here. Um, and uh, uh, David Kernahan's just, uh, just joined the group recently as a, as a kind of JISC. Uh, special advisor, um, uh, and I'm, I'm there as a kind of a, a professional advisor as well. Uh, but you can see there, there's, there's principals in uh, universities, higher, uh, senior managers in other universities, a principal of a higher education college. Um, so there's a degree of cross-sectoral interest, although the remit of the working group is actually 
uh, around the area of higher education specifically, which raises some interesting uh, questions for us. Um, and I think um, just so as you get a feel for what's going on in Wales, the number of HEIs sort of diminishes at the rate of about two a year. Um, <laughs> Um, and I don't think it's, well, it's not because the scale of the business is decreasing, it's simply because of mergers. Uh, so we're currently down to this, this small and elect uh, cluster, just to give you an idea of the scale and the scope of the, uh, of, 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 of the sector, um, although, of course, there's some HE provided by uh, further ed colleges as well. Um, so there's still quite a lot of small institutions, and they're looking at ways, maybe, of partnering up uh, Bangor and Aberyst with the currently running a joint online master's program. Um, uh, and this is kind of, it's not a MOOC, because it's not massive. Well, question is, how big does something have to be before you start calling it massive? Um, and are there things like MOOCs that we can start to, to work on? And amongst the first bits of work I've been doing is really to kind of do a survey of what is the online provision in Wales, and it's incomplete at the moment. I'm still talking to people, so I'm not presenting anything on that. But it's really finding out what online courses are on offer, be they massive or be they not massive, be they open or be they not open. And of course, I think one thing we've been finding out is there's degrees of openness or different kinds of openness, perhaps. Um, and um, in, in Wales, we have an initiative as well across all the universities called uh, APOTH, which is a blackboard uh, server in Swansea, which has a load of different courses on from different universities. And some of them are, some of them are freely available and open and others aren't. And they're all in Welsh. Um, how open does that make them to, uh, to, to, to users in general? Interesting questions. Um, but I thought I'd tell you how we're setting about this, really. Um, and, and the aim is to, uh, is, is to give some advice to government in October. <laughs> so no pressure. Um, and, and, and where, how does this advice become, how are we um, informing ourselves before giving this advice? And so these are the arrows that we're doing. So we're talking to providers, of course, we're talking to people, they're the main stakeholders who have an interest in this. Um, and we're doing the desk research, we're reading the reports, we're reading the blogs, uh, we're trying to find out what's going on on the rest of the planet. Uh, and we're, we're holding our own uh, internal discussions. Um, so this is, in a way, we've got many of the same purposes that this, that this meeting has. Um, uh, but we're sort of setting about it in this fashion over a period of time in order to try and uh, develop a kind of a position on this, even if it's a position that we, well, whatever that position may be, it may be a position to kind of, uh, it may be a tentative position, I suppose, is what I'm coming to. <coughs> Um, and and, and we, set out, we set out to do this consultation. The Welsh Government released its kind of official consultation. Six rather, rather general questions, which I won't show you now, which are very non-quantitative, qualitative questions, really designed to, to sort of start the dialogue going. And my next job is to sort of get on the phone to people and uh, find out kind of what's, what lies behind those. Sorry, this is just a blog post pointing to that. Um, and meanwhile, I've been talking to people in... In, across sectorally, we have a forum in Wales on learning technology, which is across all the sectors. Um, sectors aren't evenly represented in that. Um, but adult community learning, work-based learning, higher ed, ed and further ed are involved. <laughs> and I set up this rather dubious poll, really. Um, but <laughs> you can see here that, that, that I've sort of pointed to two rather extreme positions one might take, um, as in MOOCs are going to save everything and, uh, or, or MOOCs are just passing fad, they'll go away. So some, some people took that position, that's good. Um, but more, by far the majority were kind of in this area here, in the middle. So it's an interesting development. We need to learn and we may need to incorporate some of this into our overall practice. Um, so it's a much more kind of nuanced kind of perspective, really, on the... On the uh, on the question, um, and, and when I got them to kind of talk about this, um, these are the kinds of questions they were asking, and these are the kinds of points they were making. Um, and um, just have a quick look. <laughs> so I think there's, there's, there's some quite interesting points here, because I think that some people just want to use it for continuing professional development. 
or want to find ways of collaborating with partnerships and make it part with partners and maybe make it sort of less than massive, but make it and make it open in some way. Um, so I think there's uh, and, and others, of course, want, are interested in promoting their university or college by um, by releasing materials online, um, following the model that they, they they believe the Open University has perhaps used to do that. Um, uh, and much discussion of things like open badges, which I'm sure will, will emerge again during the course of today. <clears throat> um, th th this is the Welsh uh, Senedd in, in, in Cardiff, and I just thought that I'd just show this to provoke a little bit of thought about devolution and what that kind of means. Um, now, <laughs> it means something slightly different for Scotland uh, as it does for Wales. Um, but I think in both cases, uh, it means that we have a government w that has specific responsibilities and powers which are um, well-defined but hard to, uh, hard to analyse in, in some respects. Um, some of the Welsh government's policies are designed to kind of compensate for the UK government's approach to uh, provision of higher education in terms of tu uh, fees, etc. So we're trying to mod uh, modify and moderate the, uh, the impact of fees, uh, and, and something similar is happening in Scotland. But what implications does that have? Um, it has quite s some interesting implications for costs. So it gives the, go it gives the government a reason to want to, uh, to, to minimise costs if it didn't already have a reason, which it probably did. Uh, it gives the government a reason to look at ways of giving itself some, giving the Welsh sector some clout, um, helping, supporting universities to partner up and, 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 and those kinds of things. Um, but we're in a position now where we need to look at these developments in the role of, you know, what does a government do? Does a government, uh, it, 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 it reg it, partly it regulates, partly it supports, it supports partly by funding, um, but there's a, there's a host of stuff underlying that. And of course, in the past, we've, we've had situations where governments have looked at these kinds of scenarios where new technologies are coming on, online, on stream, and thinking, well, we can invest in new technology here, we'll set up a university, um, and, and, and we've been there with that. So um, we're looking at kind of alternative models which are a bit more... Uh, a bit more realistic and are a bit a bit more um, a bit more a bit more structured in the way that we're looking at this. So um, so we're looking um, to to all of you really to to think about where we get advice and guidance from. Um, we're looking to see uh, what approach is taken in Scotland because we think there's some very interesting parallels with Scotland, some important differences, but some interesting parallels. Um, and. Uh, that this is really by, by way of kind of starting a conversation, so I hope that. Uh, so, Jokobar Yaun and Chloed, thanks a lot for listening. <coughs> thanks very much, Paul. Um, do we have a couple of quick questions for Paul or for Turi before we break for lunch, or shall we continue the conversation upstairs over lunch? Just really a comment that you expressed your um, experience. Um, we have something similar, um, almost greater than an artificial barrier. It's not just about the translation, as you said, it's about the culture and concepts with um, the rest of the islands. We have people who use the Italian Gaelic, the Gaelic courses, but we also have Shetlandic and Octavian on all sorts of English courses, and even within the university itself. Um, just simply translating something into English or into Gaelic, a lot is lost. And it's just really to echo the experience we talked about there. Um, it'd be interesting to talk about when you come in the answers. We have <laughs> Yeah. And just, just to pick up on the point that Cable made about, you know, the kind of education resources that are available to his sons in school at the moment. And my daughter's going through Gaelic Stream Education. She's now in primary school and the, you know, there, she, there are some resources, but there are not many. 
they struggle to find reading books for children, for example, in Gaelic. And again, you know, there must be resources out there that could be translated and shared. So I think that's a, it's a very pertinent issue to discuss. And again, hopefully that's something that we can look at this afternoon as well.